SwiftUI is a powerful and modern framework for building great apps on all of Apple's platforms. And Swift Data is a powerful and modern framework for storing, querying, and filtering data. Wouldn't it be great if they both worked together somehow? Well, not only do they work together brilliantly, but they take such little code, you barely believe the results. You can create remarkable things in just a few minutes. First, the basics. Swift Data is what we call an object graph and persistence framework, which is a fancy way of saying it lets us define objects as well as properties of those objects, and then lets us read and write those things from permanent storage. The little SSD cards like an iPhone, for example. Now on the surface, this is gonna to sound to you very much like codable and user defaults, but it's much more advanced than that because Swift Data is capable of handling sorting and filtering of our data and it can work with much larger amounts of data. Effectively, there's no limit to how much data it can store efficiently and quickly. Even better, Swift Data impl implements all sorts of more advanced functionality when you really have to lean on it. Things like iCloud syncing, or lazy loading of data, or undo and redo, and much, much more. In this project, we we're using only a small amount of Swift Data's power, but that'll expand soon enough. I just want to give you a little taste of it to begin with. Now, when you made your project, I asked you not to select the box to enable Swift data support because it does add, yes, some bits get out of the way for you, but it adds extra cruft, extra example code to your project that's basically pointless and you're going to delete it anyway. So don't do that. Instead, you're going to learn how to set up Swift data by hand. It takes three steps starting with defining the data we want to use in our application. Previously, we made uh, data in our, our Swift file called something like student.swift. So let's do that now. I'll press Command N, make a new Swift file, and call this thing student.swift. And then inside there would have some code like this, at observable, uh, class student has an ID, UUID, plus a name string, and then an initializer for those two properties. That's how we've been handling so, things so far with an observable class like this one. And we can turn this thing into a Swift data object so they can save data in a database and then handle syncing with iCloud so that they can be searched and sorted and filtered and more by making two very small changes. First, we've got to add another import to the top of our file here. It is import Swift data to bring in all the Swift data functionality now. And second, we want to change this thing here at observable to be at model. And that's it. That's literally all it takes to give Swift data all the information it needs to load and save these student objects. It can now also query them, delete them, link them with other objects, and much more. It's really, really powerful. This class, hence you can guess by the name up here, is called a Swift Data Model. It defines some kind of data we want to work with in our application. Behind the scenes, this model macro actually built on the same observation system used by the at observable macro, which means this thing works really well with Swift UI out of the box. So now to find the data we want to work with, this student class right here, we can proceed with the next set, uh, step of setting up Swift UI here, writing a little bit of Swift code that will load the data model ready to use. And this code will tell Swift Data to prepare some actual physical storage on the iPhone to save data to, which is where it's gonna read and write our student objects. This work is best done in the app struct. Every project has one of these, including all the projects we've had made so far. It acts as the launch pad for our app starting up from uh, iOS. This project is called Bookworm. So you'll see over here, bookwormapp.swift. That one is our app struct. This code right here, that is our app thing here. You can see it looks a bit like regular view code. We have uh, import Swift UI here. We have a struct with some code inside. There's our content view, for example. Uh, the rest is new. And really all we care about is two parts. Uh, this app main line here, tell Swift this is what launches our application. And so internally, this actually bootstraps the whole process of launching our program when the user launches the app from the home screen, that app main thing. And then we have 
this window group thing here, this tells 50 why our app can be displayed in multiple windows. Now, fine, we're on iPhone, not really a problem here, but on iPad, on Mac OS, that does matter. Anyway, this is where we want to tell Swift data to set up all at storage for use, which again takes two small steps. First, add import Swift data. Uh, now notice, by the way, I'm a big fan of putting my imports in alphabetical order. You don't have to, doesn't matter. I like doing it. And second, we've got a modifier to the window group, telling Swift data to make this the data for our student available absolutely everywhere in our project. So I'll say on the window group, a modifier model container for student.self, like that. Now, model containers is a Swift data name. It means where it stores its data. That's a model container. And the first time your app runs, Swift data has to create the underlying database file. It's not there right now, so it makes all that storage the very first time it runs. But in future runs, it'll just load whatever was made previously. So at this point, we have made our data model over here using at model. And we've seen how to make a model container using model container four like this. The third part of this puzzle is called a model context, which is effectively the live version of your data. When you uh, load objects and you change them, those changes only exist in RAM, in memory, until they're saved back out to the model container. And so the job of the model context is basically let's work with all our data in memory because it's much faster than constantly reading and writing uh, data to disk. Every Swift data app needs some kind of model context to work with, a temporary pool of memory that's loaded right now. And we've actually made ours already. It's, it's made automatically when we have this model container for line. Swift data automatically makes one model context for us called the main context and stores it inside the Swift UI environment automatically. That completes all our Swift data configuration. So now it's time for the fun part, reading data and also writing data too. Now retrieving data from Swift data is done using a query. We describe what data we want to receive how it should be sorted, how it should be filtered, yada, yada, and then Swift data sends back all matching data for us to use. We've got to make sure that stays up to date at all times. So as we add students or delete students or whatever, the array of students stays synchronized. Now, helpfully, SwiftUI has a solution for this. And as you might have guessed, it's another at something. Uh, this time it's at query. Um, and it's available as soon as you add import Swift data to your file. And so in our content view here, I'm going to say import Swift data and then add a new property here in our content view struct, which is at query var students is a student array like so. Now this thing looks like a regular student array, but just adding the at query part at the beginning is enough to make Swift, Swift data load students from its model container for us. It automatically finds the main context based on what was placed in the environment earlier, then queries the container through that main context and finds it. We haven't specified which students to load or how to sort the results. We'll just get all of them here and it'll watch them for updates over time so if the array changes, it will reinvoke the body property. It'll make the view update as well. From here, we can start using this students thing as a regular array. So we might say down here in our body, there is a navigation stack with a list of students inside there. Give me one student coming in and then I'll do text student.name. I'll do a nav title of classroom. Now you can press command R to run the code if you want to, but there really isn't much point here because the list will always be empty. We have no data in there yet. It's doing the query, da, da, da. there's nothing to actually show. To fix that, we can add a button below our list to add some kind of uh, data to here we can actually see on the screen, basically a random student every time it's tapped here. But to do that, we've got to add an extra property to our view up here 
to read out the model context that was made earlier. What's the context of live in memory data we're working with right now? So I'll say up here at environment backslash dot model context var model context. So we're reading it out from the environment and the model container modifier from earlier placed the main context in there for us to work with. With that in place, the next steps add a button that generates random student information and saves them in our model context here. And so to help them stand out slightly, I'm gonna make a random name to each one by assigning a first names array and a random a last names array and picking one from each of them with random element. So you get a random name each time. And so for our list, I'll say we have a toolbar with a button saying add. And then our first names, that's gonna be an array of Ginny and Harry and Hermione and Luna and Ron. And for last names, we'll have uh, Granger, then Lovegood, then Potter, then Weasley. And I'll get ra pick random names from there. I'll say our chosen first name is first names dot random element force unwrap and chosen last name is last names dot random element force unwrap with more code to come here. Now I should say inevitably some folks will be saying, why are we using a force unwrap here? Why don't we do nil coalescing? I've literally just made these two arrays have values inside. They're constant. These will definitely, definitely work. Uh, if you really hate the force unwrap, fine. You can nil coalesce something else. It doesn't really matter. Anyway, now for the interesting part. We're going to make a student object in place. There's more code to come stuff. I'll say, let a new student be a student with the ID of a random UUID and a name of a chosen first name and then chosen last name. And finally, we're to ask our model context to actually add this student to its storage, which means it'll be queued up for saving as soon as possible. And so we'll say uh, model context dot insert that student. Now at last, you should be able to press command R to run the whole thing back and then press add a few times. Let's find out. Add. Okay, Hermione Granger. Hermione Potter, Ron Potter, Luna Granger. Da, da. It's basically making a whole bunch of random folks whenever it's pressing uh, add. Even better, if I go back to Xcode and press Command R again, quit the app, we launch the app, we should see, boom, all our names are there. Swift Data's automatically saved them for us. Now you might think this was an awful lot of learning for not a lot of result. But now you know what models are, what model containers are, model contexts are. You've seen how to insert data, how to query data. You've seen quite a lot already. And we're going to look at Swift data much, much more in the next project after this one, as well as further in the future. But for now, you've come far enough. This was the last part of the overview for this project. So please press undo uh, to get back to the original version of your code. Once you have that for content view, please make sure you also delete this student model. Boom, move to trash. And then undo changes to mod, uh, the bookworm app file as well. So the whole thing is clear, ready to start the main project.